because there's so many things that you want to get into place right away. There's only so many places that you can hang a flyer. There's so many ways you could do a flyer. Everything is so very overwhelming and you're in crisis. The last mm-hmm. thing you want to sit down and do is, is sit there and Google, you know, my kid is missing. What do I do? Charla Collins, our guest, knows all about it. Her daughter has gone missing many times, and she is sharing a wealth of information to help you if someone you love with a serious mental illness has gone missing. There's a lot to learn. Be prepared with this episode. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. We're so glad you're here for episode 73 of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. Today, four, which is, uh, we often jump from three to four moms in the trenches in some of our episodes. But today is a particularly exciting episode because this fourth mom is going to share tips that I hope you never need, but you may need. And if somebody you love goes missing, many of us don't know what to do and where to begin. So our guest who's coming on in just a second, we're just going to do a quick catch up. Charla is going to share with us a PowerPoint filled with information that she shared with her local NAMI chapter and other places as well. And we're going to bring her on in just a second with an introduction. But um, I just want to let you know that this is episode 73. And we have two more episodes coming up to this season three of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. We are going to learn all about the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance with our guest Gordon in our next episode. And we'll end the season with an interview with Elisa Roth, award-winning journalist and author of a book called Insane, all about incarceration and mental illness. I am in the process of reading it and full disclosure, um, I'm relating to it a bit too much because my son got arrested for the first time and is in not prison, but jail awaiting his court date. So I have a whole new set of things to learn about and hopefully to avoid. So we're here to educate. Oh, sorry. So oh, sorry. Thank you. You know, we are three moms with three sons in various stages on the roller coaster of recovery, and we're here to help as best we can. I got to meet my cohort, Mindy, in person at the- Mindy um, is taller than I thought that she's almost as tall as me. She tried to pretend she was taller, but (laughs) we got to the bottom of it when we compared our backs. (laughs) But she's almost as tall as me. And Randy, you just sparkle in person. I mean, you sparkle on YouTube, but so much more so on person. It was so much fun. Oh, thank you so much. Imagine that we had that in person. Yeah, Mimi and I have met in person. So now we all have to have the three of us in one room. We will get there. But there is something very special about in-person energy. And uh, I'm glad we got to to have that. And oh boy, we if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see we're going to post some pictures of me and Mimi hugging real tight. And um, and, and we have be... Min- Mindy rather than Mimi. You yes, so I'm sorry. Mindy. Well, you know what? I'll post the ones of me and Mimi, Mimi hugging real tight two, <laughs> two years ago, too. So anyway, yeah. that was uh, delightful. And that's everything that's going on. You guys okay? Should we get right to Charla's presentation? Or do you yeah. have anything you would like to share about anything before we... I just want to say um, I feel so bad for you with um, with your son in jail. And I just had lunch today. I have two groups. I think I've mentioned on this podcast, five moms, two different groups of five moms. I'm the common mom in each group. And one of the moms in the group that had lunch today, her son is in jail and she had to cut the lunch short to go to court. He is in district court, felony court, and um, he was deemed incompetent. So sent back to jail. He will be there two more weeks. He's been there two weeks. And then he will come to court again and probably be ruled incompetent. He has a test to see about that in the meanwhile. But she's in your same shoes. So I was thinking of both of you today. Thank you. It is a whole new world I'm learning about uh, by 
doing research, if we think we have very little power when our sons are in the hospital, even if we're conservators, conservatorship at the moment seems to mean nothing if your child is incarcerated. Um, ben is awaiting a court date for something he swears he didn't do, of course. Uh, but you know what? At the moment, once the shock was over, and it was like a shock, but he is um, sounding more like himself because he's no longer high. And he doesn't seem to hate it. I mean, he's on a, you know, we were talking with Charlie before, you know, he's on a regular schedule. He's got, he's in minimum security. He's got 55 people to play cards with and practice Spanish with. And um, I know where he is. And so looking on the bright side for now. So we'll keep you posted on that. That's another, it's just a whole new world. And I'm seeing the powerlessness. If you think nobody returns your phone calls when your son is in the hospital, they do not return your phone calls. If you try to reach a counselor, because they probably are overloaded with a caseload. So more on that later. Uh, here's another situation. Uh, Mimi, anything to update with? You okay? No, we're good. Status quo on my end. I was very disappointed that Nick wouldn't go to the Dr. Leitman's thing in New York and I didn't get to see you guys, but maybe next year. Maybe next year. There's yeah, always next, next year, year if we're if we're lucky. So and who knows, maybe someone will book the three of us to come and do a triple talk and then we can do that as well. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're here with episode 73 and I want to bring on our guest who actually was on our last episode telling one of the storytellers, which you know, we got a lot of positive comments on that episode. Thank you so much. And we always have at least one comment that says five minutes isn't enough to tell your story. And boy, do we know it, but we're doing our best. And I hope that the taste you got of each story help you feel less alone. Uh, Charla is back. And Charla Collins' daughter, Kylie, lives with severe mental illness and after, and this was, if you remember the story, if you listen to episode 72, this was especially after suffering a traumatic brain injury in her teens. And her diagnosis and situation includes drugs and, um, you know, little resources to get the long term mental health care she needs. She often disappears into the streets. I know I've been there. Um, she goes long periods without contact. So trying to, mind this situation to help other people as we are doing with this podcast. Charla has created information to share with others. So welcome, Charla Collins. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate you guys' pod, pod, <laughs> podcast. I enjoy your shows. And so um, I appreciate the opportunity to share the information to try to help and reach as many as I can. Um, yeah, so where to start with Miss Kylie? Oh my gosh. Oh, so, yeah. So I'm going to, you know, we, you told a bit of the story last week. So if you can mm -hmm. give us just anyone who didn't who didn't hear the episode, um we really want this to be an informational episode and I'm right. sure the story will come out as you're sharing what you learned. Can you give us a 1 minute synopsis or did I pretty much give it in the introduction? You pretty much did. You know, the thing that is she had her head injury and then as she, and, and that was really when she was 11 and as she went into her teens is when the drugs started in, it started out with weed and drinking. And then we, we went into cutting and, you know, um, somewhat an anorexia. So we did the eating disorders and then it just, she started having children and then it just kind of just went off the chart since then. Um, yeah, she has yeah. three sons. I have three grandsons, um, 11, seven, and six. And that certainly and adds a lot to the picture. And it's something that none of us are dealing with right now with, and you know, no, none of our sons have fathered children. So that uh, is a different situation. I won't call it more or less. I imagine those boys are living with you. Right. They are. Well, two of them are living with me. One lives with family in Colorado. The oldest does. Um, because naively at the beginning, I thought, oh, you know what? Things are going to turn around. And so I'm going to focus on her and let someone else in the family take care of my grandson. No, that didn't happen. 
Yeah. No. It's, um, you know, I've taught many, many family to families uh, that if you don't know what that is, that's a, a free course offered by the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI or NAMI, depending on how you say it, but it all works. I'm just going to push record on my phone here, just safety, superstition, just to make sure we're good. And, you, you know, we often there are many grandparents in the room who are worried about their child and also worried about the progeny of their children. So, but we're here to talk about what happens when a loved one goes missing and you can't absolutely. Find it. So, so Charla, I'm going to, should I start sharing the screen or? Um, well, sure. You could do that. When, when my daughter first went missing and I don't even think I have that flyer on the list of flyers I gave y'all. Um, the first time she went missing was when she was 16 um, she had gone to a treatment center and she didn't want to go back. And she knew if she got dabbled back into drugs, where's mom going to send her, you know? And so she took off. She ran. Um, she was found by the police and taken to like a halfway house because juvenile hall was full. And yeah, I mean, it was really traumatic for her in that she had another head injury. A police officer really roughed her up. And um, she ended up having a seizure, a grand mal seizure. That was her first grand mal seizure was after that incident. And we were in Seattle. You know, it's really hard to look for someone who's missing in Oklahoma City. But I can't tell you how hard. Hard doesn't even come close to describing looking in a metropolitan area like Seattle mm -hmm. and trying to search every nook and cranny. Um, and so, but she didn't, you know, after we found her that one time and she was gone about a week, you know, and, and I had a church that came out and helped me and it wasn't quite what TV tells you, you know, all of us have this impression. If my loved one goes missing, they're going to set up a command center, you know, they're going to have something on the phone and, and there's going to be an officer there 24. No, no, nobody shows up. You know, I was, um, lucky that I had a police officer within an hour or two that would show and meet up with me um, to take down the information and they may or may not take a picture. And, you know, and then you're kind of on your own and that's what I learned. And so that's kind of where I started a Facebook page to help other families. And I really got into, okay, this is where our system's failing. And this is how I can help if, other families. You know, if I could break in here just for a minute, I can't even imagine how you felt, you know, I always thought if it was a juvenile missing that they would do more. My son, thank the Lord, has not ever been missing any longer than two or three days. And I just was a basket case, but he was an adult. And so I always thought that's why the police wouldn't do anything. They said they have to be missing, you know, a very long time before we do anything. We can post it. I don't think they ever did anything. But even for a juvenile, that's all they do. Yeah, no, they don't even do that. Uh, I mean, so there's a database um, that they will put them in. It's called NAMUS. It's N-A-M-U-S. And it's the National Missing Person Database and Unidentified People, because we have a lot of uh, unidentified people in the system. And so they will input them there, but that's only, ready for this, 14 states. Hmm. Out of our whole country, only 14 states put their missing in there. Right now, we have 24,000 roughly listed as missing nationwide. But we know that there's really closer to 600,000. And we don't have a database that covers everything. Um, slowly, states are looking at, you know, adopting changes and requiring. So if you have someone... Like my daughter went missing and she wandered. She was looking for a portal to time travel. So she took off for California. She hitchhiked. So California is not the database. Um, and so it really didn't mean anything to them that she was. And so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So let's. We have, so I'll dive in. So, yeah. So yeah. over the years, so, you know, over the years, um, she's dabbled and had problems, but really, in 2019 is when the wheels fell off the bus. She had a really bad breakup. Uh, her boyfriend at the time, baby daddy, had actually tried to kill her. There was some domestic violence going on that I was unaware of. And, you know, she said she was suicidal. Please take care of my kids. And 
like any parent, okay, you know, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to, you know, help them, take them to a hospital. That became kind of problematic. But what became very clear to me is, as her parent is I needed to get guardianship because she it's it's more than suicidal. She is not taking care of herself at all. She was very paranoid. I was just seeing all those signs. And this, this she hadn't even been diagnosed with schizophrenia yet. And so, um, so yeah, I um, had guardianship. And it's not respected. A little bit like what you said, Randy. <laughs> you know, you go through all the work to get a guardianship is what they call in Oklahoma. In other states, it could be conservatorship. And they don't realize like we had to go to a judge, we had to bring records, we have multiple hearings, and then we'd have to go back to court every 90 days because they hadn't met her yet and they wanted to be sure you weren't lying. And so there was all these steps that had to be taken and yet your medical providers, it meant nothing to them. Yeah. So she would get released from a hospital and then I would call to go, hey, oh, what do you mean you let her go? Where's she at? She's, she's not yeah. functioning. <laughs> yeah, she's there's, you know, there's so much. And just for our listeners, two things. <laughs> if you're, if you're more curious about conservatorship and guardianship, I want to direct you to an episode that we have. I don't know the number of it, but if you, if you go to you know, Apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and you find us and you do a search on conservatorship or guardianship, an episode will come up on that. Also, we have a two-part episode with Judge Lisa Wexler, who happened to have been the probate judge that has so far helped me maintain my conservatorship for my son. She's a fount of information as well in the state of Connecticut, and we all know it varies across the state. So guardianship matters, but it isn't everything. And I'm shocked. You know, I have this vision of like, oh, if someone's missing, but like, oh, if a child's missing in the woods, the whole town comes out and they do a search party and it's not like that. And in the course of teaching family to family, I have met people whose child and schizophrenia or in in mania with bipolar or any kind of psychosis, they were able to function for a while, save money, get a good credit rating, and then they get psychotic and they just take off for a foreign country on a plane. And how do you go to Israel or Germany or Amsterdam and try to find a loved one when you don't even speak the language? So we all agree it's a problem. <laughs> We've yes. all been through it to an extent. So let, let's get to the presentation that you created to help others through this. And as you're going through this, I think we'll learn more of your story. Um, and this will contain valuable information. So if you're watching on YouTube for a while, you're going to see me sharing my screen with the PowerPoint on it. So, but while, we'll she, while you're doing that, I'll just say one of the moms in my other, another five moms group, her son who does have bipolar disorder went to Bali last month. Oh my gosh. I know. Well, I thought California was bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and who then he didn't have enough money to come home. <laughs> didn't have enough money to come home or his girlfriend. Wow. Yeah, no. Mine wasn't wow. stable enough to take public transportation. The The Riverside PD begged me to come out and get her. And so I had to fly out to California, rent a car and bring her across country. Now, at the time, it sounded like a great idea. But, you know, you should really sleep on something like that because it got really scary. <laughs> and then I understood why she couldn't be on public transportation. <laughs> Oh, All cool. right, Charla, I've got the the screen. Can, you guys should be yes, able to yes. see it, right? So I'm I'm not going to do it in slideshow mode. I'm just going to do it this way, so I have a little more control. So here's okay. your opening. What to do? I'm going to kind of give the microphone to you, and we'll only pop in if we like. We'll just pretend we're participants, which we really are, and we'll pop in if we have a question. Sound good? And you tell me when to change the slide. Okay. What What do you want me to say to, to have you change it? Just say, just change. change the slide. Okay. <laughs> or say, next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> We're very casual here. Change the slide. You know, and if you if you are listening to this, uh, you know, Charla will present most of what's on the slides. I know we, you know, we get about a thousand views on, uh, on YouTube and please feel free to go there and subscribe and you'll be informed when there's a new episode. But if you are listening in your car, there are many more downloads that way. So you won't be able to see the slides, but most of what is on the slide is text and Charla will be sharing most of it. So I wouldn't worry. Yes, ma'am. 
All right. And, and I'm willing to share the PowerPoint with anybody. I mean, they just need to contact you. You can give it to them. I don't mind sharing it. Okay. So if you wish to have a, a copy of the PowerPoint, contact me at randy at randyk.com. And my name is spelled R-A-N-D-Y-E at Randy, R-A-N-D-Y-E, K-A-Y-E dot com. And I will forward a copy of that to you. Also, Charlie, before I forget, what is the name of your Facebook page for people dealing with missing loved ones? It's See Me OKC. So S-E-E-M-E-O-K-C. Okay. See Me OKC. C. Yeah. For okay. Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much. All right. The, uh, the floor is yours, as they say. All right. So um, go ahead and change the screen or change the slide. I'll say slide. How's that slide? So um, this is a picture of the nine missing flyers that ended up um, being made with the exception of the, the really big long one that was a billboard that we have put up um, of my daughter. And just um, if you look through there, you'll see all of this pretty much took place in, in 2020, 2021, and 2022, um, which was the three years of, of psychosis, um, basically, she was experiencing. If you go to the next slide, um, here are some really important websites and resources where I was able to find good information. If you go to the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they have a 1-800 number, the Faces of the Lost also has a 1-800 number and the National Runaway Safe Line. I also found it very helpful to contact um, a state organization like NAMI or the local NAMI affiliates. Um, every state has a NAMI office and everyone has a local affiliate. So they can kind of help you um, if your child has taken off or, or is missing in a certain area. Um, so what do you do first? You know, you figure out that your son or your daughter, aunt, uncle, mother, father, someone is not where they're supposed to be and they were expected. Um, a lot of people have misinformation thinking that you have to wait 24 hours and that's simply not the case. The first thing that you want to do is you want to call the police. You want to call 911 and report them missing right away. Even if it later turns out that, oh, they were, you know, there was some logical reason for, for why you couldn't reach them or um, they weren't where they're supposed to be, you can always easily, you know, contact the police and have them removed from the system. But you really want to call the police as soon as you know that they're missing. And then um, another thing that a lot, I get a lot of questions about is where do I call the police? Um, you want to call one that's the closest to you because that's a department that's going to be your lifeline. If you get assigned a detective and if they're going through the process of helping you, that's going to be the closest department. Um, but, you know, really determining when to call, it's really going to be different for every family. You know, um, I get where people go, you know, my aunt kind of goes off the radar for a week at a time or whatever. And so you just have to listen to your heart. That's what I always tell people feel, you know, what you feel most comfortable with. Um, but for the most part, if your loved one's out of state, you still want to report them missing in state so that they get really? entered. Yes. So they get entered into the mi missing database. Nam or I almost said NAMI, NAMUS, which is N A M U S dot gov is the page, but the police, that's where they will be entering them. Um, and there's several reasons for that because not every state puts their missing into the national database. Actually, we only have 14 states nationwide that are required, require their law enforcement to place people into NAMUS when they go missing. I don't know what the rest of the states are doing. Um, I'm just really grateful that I live in Oklahoma for that reason, if nothing else, that, that they do put, they do have a law that requires people to be placed in there. At any given time, we have about 600,000 nationwide that are missing. And in NamUs right now, there's just under 24,000 listed. Um, just while you were, when you talked about NamUs at the beginning, I Googled NamUs and then 
tried to find out if Minnesota is listed on there, but you have to log in and do a password. So I thought I'll do it later, but it does exist and it looks pretty easy to check on your state. So thank you. Not a problem. We have Washington, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Illinois, Michigan, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, West Virginia, New York, Connecticut, and Texas. Texas just joined, um, I think it was a year and a half ago. Huh. Um, NamUs has only been around since 2005. So in 2005 is when they came together and had like a committee that decided we need to have a federal, you know, something federal that includes all the states. Well, they didn't really start inputting people for about six years. I, I don't know what they did for those six years, but it didn't really get up and running until closer to 2011. Um, they updated their software in 2016 and they started including unidentified people. So they have a spot in there where you can actually look and see people who have been identified. So in our state, for instance, Oklahoma requires you give a thumbprint when you get a state ID or a driver's license. Um, so when they find someone in Oklahoma, they you know, scan their thumbprint and ideally they'll come up with the person, but that doesn't always mean that someone's gonna show up and, and claim them. So we have in the database, there's a list of unclaimed people who they know who they are, but no one's showed up to pick up their, their remains. And then you have the people who nobody knows who the heck they are. And then you have the missing folks. Okay. I have a question. I just wanna go back to one thing that you said because it, I'm, yes, pretty, um, I'm puzzled about it. I have myself experienced calling and being told by the police that you can't report them missing for 24 hours. Now, is that just a big misconception or I mean, is it, does it differ state to state? I was told the same thing. Me, me yeah. too. So I, me too. Call us back in 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was told that was a huge misconception by the <laughs> friends that I have in law enforcement. And then even the investigators that um, I work with you know, locally, um, because that's the critical 24 hours, especially yeah. if your loved one has a mental illness and you know that, you know, um, or if they're a child, you know, we had a case this past week where um, I had a family reach out to me and I told them, get, get an alert. Now, you, Amber Alert is really hard to get. There's a lot of misconceptions about the Amber Alert, a uh, very tight criteria for this. But an, an endangered missing person, EMA, is very similar to, an, like everybody's phone went off for this alert. And that's kind of what you needed. This, this child had been lured away from their home to a truck stop. And an EMA was issued and they were able to find the kids 60 miles away with the same people, you know. But it was getting the alert, getting law enforcement to really jump on it. And like, this is, this is really, you know, should be top importance so um so yeah they were i wonder know, if out the difference heads. is you know you're talking amber alert and you mentioned the child i wonder if the difference is child versus adult that you should call right away if it's a child but they won't take anything if it's an adult which you know our children are vulnerable like children when they are Absolutely. adults but um i think when we call and try to get help in the mental health system when they're adults they're treated sometimes like adults yeah. Mm -hmm. We all, you know, I, I think the nation rallies around the innocent. You know, we sure. all rallied around baby Jessica in the well. We're all looking at the the situation in Pakistan with the with the you know the car dangling from the cable. You know, we that well, anyway, that but well, what we digress, but yes, but if a if an adult that acts like a child is missing, a lot of the empathy and the action often isn't there. But I what know. you have, and I know you have like 10 more slides to go, but definitely call <laughs> the police. Don't definitely accept the, the police. Bring photographs. And, yes, and let them know about sure. medication. Right. Right. Medication okay. will get you one of those alerts for sure. At least in my state, that that can get you an endangered missing person. If there's a medication or condition that they have that they can't go 24 hours without 24 hours without that, without being in a medical emergency. And so they they will do that alert for that. And that's where I've seen other families be successful in getting that alert. Um, and I that's a newer thing, like last year. Go ahead, honey. 
Go ahead, Mimi. What um, we I just googled it, and it says there is no waiting period for reporting a missing person. All uh -huh. California police and sheriff's departments must accept any record report, including a report by telephone of a missing person, including runaways, without delay, and will give priority to handling the report. So I guess okay. we're all been misinformed. All right, thank you. That's part of it. And then they do have some new laws here in Oklahoma. We had one come out because we have a very large indigenous population. I think we're the se second largest um, state. And so they have new legislation because on federal lands, it's even different. So they had someone go missing. Four years later, that kid is found less than a mile from where he went missing. Wow. Nobody so just so but, so so we know, you know, just to we have about we're about halfway through our hour. So I, I, I all of this is very, very vital. I just want to make sure that we yes, get all 12 slides this. in. <laughs> so I yes, hate to say because they were like, why is she always <laughs> interrupting the guest? Well, we have, you know, we have a lot, a lot to share and it. And it's so important. And we've learned so much already. I just want to give you that guideline. Yes, Mimi is our traffic cop, and we appreciate it because we do want to hear it all. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll go back to our slide. So bring photographs. You want to be sure when you meet with the police officer, which I encourage everybody to do, um, you bring a picture that they can input then. Give them the picture. Let them keep the picture because so many of our missing do not have photographs. And so it's so critical that we have a, a good face shot and also something like if they dyed their hair recently or they like it up or down, have some variations there, shaved versus unshaved, that sort of thing. Um, if you have a loved one that's under the age of 21, you want to be sure that you also have them uploaded into the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Those are the flyers that you see at Walmart when you first go in. Those are the folks that have, you know... Um, and, and they do, they concentrate mostly on just kids. And it's whatever you age you were at the time you went missing. So there are some folks in, in that database that are you know, in their thirties, but they went missing when they were 12. So, um, okay. but let's see what else I wanted to cover. Mm. Oh, <clears throat> an important thing that's really important for our kids is that if you have a loved one with severe mental illness that's over the age of 21, the police cannot hold them against their will unless they're showing they meet criteria. And they, so they look like they're a danger to themselves or others. Um, or committed a crime, I see her. Exactly. Right. And so that, unless you have a guardianship in place, and so that's a real hard one for a lot of parents. Um, so let's see, I want, so I always recommend people to contact an investigator. Not all investigators are created equal. I'm fortunate to know a couple that are free for families um, because there's so many things that you wanna get into place right away. There's only so many places that you can hang a flyer. There's so many ways you could do a flyer. You know, everything is so very overwhelming and you're in crisis. The last mm -hmm. thing you wanna sit down and do is, is sit there and Google, you know, my kid is missing, what do I do? you know? Right. Um, and so you want to figure out a budget early on. That's something that people don't tell you. <laughs> Missing flyers are really expensive. Those billboards are really expensive. Um, you need to figure out kind of what you can budget for and, and kind of figure out if you need more, you know, if you have someone that can help you with that financially. Um, and your flyers should always be one page only include the medications the recent pictures any tattoos, piercing, or unique birthmarks, height, weight, age, if they have a vehicle, a photo of the car, license plate, last place they roughly were seen, where the closest police department that took your report is and, and or your investigator and their phone number. That's what you want to have on a flyer slide. <laughs> okay. I keep forgetting slide. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next slide, did you say? Yes, ma'am. There you go. All right. Oh, so this is all right. So this is the slide about the investigator, the poster, everything you just said. Don't list your own phone number. No. And here's why. And and you see, like, oh, they have on TV, they play it so corny. But I can tell you, I had someone at one point 
tell me, hey, if you can get me a tent and a sleeping bag, you know, I'll tell you where your daughter is. Oh, and of course, I had I had already been out for hours going tent to tent, and and so I took it under the you know off the cuff, but you know uh, I didn't get really offended. I kind of just laughed it off. But there are people, other people that have told me stories or have experience where it was like extortion, and that's the other thing you definitely don't want to deal with when you're in crisis already. You're trying to hold it together, you know. Right. So you want to reach out to some of your friends. And any acquaintances or anybody you know who could help you. And you want to delegate some things. So things that you feel comfortable with because it's so easy to get overwhelmed so quickly. Um, if you can imagine, and I don't know what it's like where you guys are at, but in Oklahoma City, nothing's connected. So even when I filed the police report, that didn't get to all the police officers. I literally was going to every spot where they would go hang out to get coffee or go to the bathroom and handing out flyers to them to be sure they knew. Um, the hospitals, none of them were connected. So if there's a, a small local community hospital and a major, you know, they seem they, they have the same name, you would think they're the same, they're not. And so <clears throat> they're not going to talk to you anyway. I tried to do it. Everybody always says, oh, hospital. No, hospital's not going to really tell you anything and they're not going to hang a flyer. They're not. Um, some churches are receptive to it or not. Homeless shelters, at least in Oklahoma City, are against it. They will not hang a flyer. Um, and the library's okay with it, but the homeless shelters, what I was told, the excuse I was given is that, well, they don't want to scare their people away. Um, but I'm like, I'm her mother. I have a guardianship. Um, and that didn't get me very far. It was really hard. I actually had to stand in, in the parking lot, wait till shift change, and then try to get each individual as they were leaving um, to look at a flyer and see if they had seen her. So it's very, um, I, I'm looking at the slide that's in front of us and you say, miss visit your missing loved ones, social media accounts to see if there are any clues. Yes. Um, that would assume you had their password or is there some other way to do no. that? No. Um, I'm like, I mean, you can check that? what they've posted. If you follow exactly. that, I think that's what that means. Oh, so. I, sorry. I see right. what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And you know, and you that's a people very like good thing. thing. When I had a missing kid, that's what I did. I not only looked at the kids Facebook, but the friends and you can get yes. a ton of information that way. No, and actually in my spare time, which I don't have a lot of, <clears throat> I do that to help people, families that do report their loved one missing that the, the picture for whatever reason doesn't get uploaded. I look for those pictures so I can help them make a flyer so that someone can help find their child. That's so, my son is not on social media, so that's why I'm kind of clueless about how that <laughs> yeah. would help. But other people's kids are, of course. <laughs> All right. So we've got so also, we've got you know, details here about the flyers. How many do you yes. get? If you can just run through that quickly, because that's really, yes, these are things I've never even thought of. No. So this and is so great. You want to get color pictures because let's face it, black and white, uh, you don't really see them. And there's definitely, you lose the detail and there's no point in hanging something that's not going to help. And so if you were to go to Staples or Office Depot, oh, they're going to be so upset I said that, but to the big name coffee places, they're going to charge you up to, you know, $1.25 a page. Mm -hmm. Which, if you're doing 200 to 500 flyers, that's a lot. Right. And so you want to find the little mom and pop local print shops because they will work out a deal with you. I have one guy that that donated gave me 500 flyers for free and that freed up money for me to do a billboard his billboards are a hundred dollars a day okay. so that that gets really hard to slide um but yeah want them to be in color and then here's the thing you know i remember at one point being so upset and going i'm gonna hang this flyer everywhere and actually there was one street i did i literally went like every five steps i hung it on a pole the city would come up behind me and just throw them away. The city doesn't want their city littered with flyers. That's why you don't see flyers anymore. Um, and so there's so many places where you can't hang up flyers. So bus stops, bus stations, convenience stores, restaurants, gas stations, truck stops is a definite no. Um, but yeah, diner. Where can you hang them? Oh, so this is how you get around it. Okay. <laughs> I'm all about finding how do I get around this problem? And so you go to 
the person that's on on duty, let's say at the convenience store, the gas station is a good place. So um, you ask to see the manager and you ask, hey, can you hang this up in your employee break room? Because the employees are going to be the ones that see people coming through anyway, because they're okay. recognizing if you're going to rob them or not. They're, they, you know, they're watching for people that stand out. And so I see flyers for missing cats and dogs all over the place all the time. And they're on telephone poles or I know. street signs or just popping up on, you know, some, some kind of wire or whatever. Yeah. In the parks. So oh, yeah, no, that are not them. legal. Maybe they just no. put them up there, but they don't seem to get taken down. I, I, I even went to the Capitol at one point <laughs> and hung up the flyers so that when they came into work, they could see it because I was so upset. Um, after one time, she got dumped by a, a mental health hospital while court ordered to go to the state hospital. And they didn't tell me for three days. And so I was behind the eight ball. I was upset. And right. so, um, no, there's just so many places. Right, so employee hang. break rooms, that's a great idea. Any other workarounds you have for the flyers before we move on? Absolutely. The other one I was going to say is, um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Break rooms, the bathrooms, but also some of these, these places, even the truck stops, they have security just like Walmart, just like all these other places, like Walmart won't hang up flyers, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, you go to their security, they'll upload it to their page and they'll share it with all their security friends. And so that's the shelters have security, you know, all these different people have security at night. And so at least you're getting it out there and mm -hmm. there'll be that one person that'll see it. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so if there's an area and there's different times that kind of had suspected a certain area where she was at, that's the area that I would kind of camp out, if you will, you know, and go and stand outside businesses and talk to people. You know, if you won't hang my flyer, I'm just going to, <laughs> I'm going to talk to all these people. Okay. <laughs> I even had one, a few times where I knew they weren't going to hang the flyer. So, but it was too cold for them to come outside and remove it. So I still taped it on the side of the ice box anyway because i wanted to get the word out you could always hand them to people in cars but you can see how that becomes problematic when they cost so much so it's really finding where can i be effective and that's going to be on facebook that's going to be in some different facebook groups you know even some of these ads you know where you can go in and in such and such town and they sell whatever you put your kid for free a picture of them which sounds really bad but everybody looks at that and they share it it's getting people to see it. If you can get news to pick it up, that's great. I had a really hard time getting the news to pick up anything locally because their policy was that first the police department had to post it on their Facebook page. <laughs> and right. it, so, it was like pulling teeth. So, so social media is, is a, a good outlet for that if you can. And also I see that, uh, Flyers at hospitals, you say, yes. is a waste of time. It is. Um, it is. So, and, and one time your loved one had actually been an inpatient and no one noticed. So I think social media, trying to get the personal touch uh, are, are workarounds for that and just trying your best, right? And you don't want to waste all that money if, I'm, if it's just going to be taken down. Well, and all that energy too, because yeah. you're in crisis. You're freaking out inside. And so standing and trying to introduce yourself to every single person coming outside a hospital and, and handing a flyer, that's why I say you really have to get some friends that can come with you and help help you so you can keep your sanity and your wits about you through this storm. Okay. You know, so right. TikTok, I actually made a TikTok video. At one point. Really? <laughs> it got a lot of shares and it was like, Yes, I'm just a mom out here. And I was showing, I was off-roading in my car trying to find camps to go to, to check out. Because she was, she had decided she would go hide in a homeless encampment. And so it was really big one too. And so I was out there looking for it. And I did a TikTok and people just loved it, you know? So TikTok, Did it work though? Did it work? It, I don't know. You know, the police found her that time and I did have a billboard. So I'm not sure if it was the TikTok or the billboard. <laughs> okay. Well, but you know, you cover all. You, 
<laughs> cover all your bases, right? So now yes. and on the next slide, you do mention the security agency, which is a great, great idea. I see the TikTok video. Oh, so all of this mm -hmm. has already been covered on this slide. So I'm going to move on to this yes, next slide where it says pace yourself. Absolutely. So just like at the beginning, and it's it's so easy to say it now, but I know in the moment you're it's really hard, but you have to come up with a reasonable budget, but you also have to budget your time, you know, because life keeps going, you know? Yep. And so um, a lot of people don't think about that. You know, you can't, I would try to spend every spare moment. And now that I'm raising my young two grandsons, I literally would have to wait until my husband came from home from work at night. And that was my time to go. So from 10 p.m. until about 4 a.m., I was out looking. And then I would come home, sleep maybe four hours and start all over again. The and I, I did job. that for a couple years. And it was really super hard. But when I could, you know, taking time to shut down. And I did have a couple of things that helped me, you know, um, exercising does. Even if you just go to the pool and, and walk in the water. That's really helpful doing little things like that. But the other thing, you know, a lot of people go, why would you share a missing flyer of a kid missing from California and Oklahoma? Because these kids can go anywhere. We had a kid who was in a wheelchair in the winter who escaped a juvenile detention center and made it to Florida in a week. I go, anything's possible. And with no money, no nothing in a wheelchair made it wow. and so I go, Any, anything's really possible okay <laughs> and so you have to really be open to there's so many times I found my daughter in areas that were not on the radar where I didn't hang flyers I, I it was by the grace of God that she was ever found mm -hmm. and so it's so important but having you know, pacing yourself is so important yeah, um, absolutely I love this tip also about um spend the 10 bucks and boost your post and choose your audience that I'd never thought about that, but that's something you can do on Facebook. It costs you a little bit of money, but if you choose who might see it, that's a, that's a really, really good tip. I like, I, I like all that you said, like put it on garage sales sites, mm -hmm. not just missing person pages, any community pages that don't have rules about what you can post national weather service. That oh is my gosh. I say that was my funnest one is they would go, it's going to be 110. I go, oh my God, it's going to be so hot. It's going to make it so hard to look for my missing daughter flyer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, this is creative. And and jump to the last one on this slide too, which is about the media. How else have you used the media to be helpful to you? Um, I don't know. Um, also just, I don't know. Um, I took out a half page ad in a paper that I saw a homeless person reading. And I paid $200. It ran for a month. I mean, I found her the following week, but. <laughs> okay. Also going to folks and going, hey, um, you know, I have my kids missing, have them do a story. You know, some people um, will do a story, but I really found that um, you have to throw shame to the wayside. You know, I can't let your pride get in your way because that keeps you from finding your loved one. You know, because people overall really do want to help you, you know. Um, yeah. All right. And so uh, go to our next slide. So, um, yeah, the, and the area where you start searching, I always tell people start where you, your last were seen and kind of go from there and work a circle, just kind of go around <clears throat> because that area might be, you know, um, an area where they'll, I don't know, might not have gotten too far away from there, you know, um, with the exception of when she, like I said, took her show on the road hitchhiking to California when is seeing that one <laughs> she's a stubborn kid <laughs> um so in the next one I talk a little bit about self-care and so some things that I did that helped me get my maximum amount of sleep in that four hours I would get day in and day out you know I listen to brainwave CDs I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Jeffrey Thompson He's a guy from the seventies and he did these CDs and you can find them on YouTube and you can find how long you have. And that's how long you want it to go. And it would just play in a loop. 
Hmm. And it's like the best sleep ever. You're listening to the ocean and then you wake up and you've been out for five hours, you know? Dr. Jeffrey rested. Thompson and he's on YouTube. Okay, that's awesome. Delta so, waves. Yes. And then I learned that when I'm under a lot of stress and like a lot of folks, you deplete your body of magnesium. And so when you take these calm gummies or powdered magnesium, it helps it helps relax you some. And so it takes the edge off. Um, and then do, 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 do. I'm involved in NAMI too, Randy. <laughs> so I have my NAMI support groups that I go to. And actually one of my big helpers is I have a golden doodle. Uh, bless her heart. She's 109 pounds at five and a half years old. And her name is NAMI. <laughs> oh. <laughs> NAMI, wow. say hi. <laughs> yeah that's what you should have put nami's picture there in, oh, in the no, that would have been perfect but yeah she's my big distressor um and then the next slide it talks about so you something that i've learned personally that worked for me is that we have so much garbage emotional baggage and frustrations and everything that we're taking on we have to grieve. We have to let some of the sadness go. So I just tell people like, you have permission to cry. It's something that we don't think about as adults anymore. But mm -hmm. crying really helps release all of that because otherwise you become bitter. And I mean, nobody nobody wants to be bitter and nobody wants to be around somebody who's bitter. <laughs> Very true. So, um, and then distracting yourself. You know, Oftentimes when like that 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., I was jamming to like 80s music, okay? It distracts yourself a little bit from the severity of what's going on. Also how sad and heart-wrenching it is, you know, um, the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, I love and then that. Last, oh, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we talk a lot about finding joy. It's our... It's our responsibility in a way to ourselves and to the other people that we love to find joy in our lives. We're not going to help our loved one by being mired in grief all the time. I mean, feelings come and they need to be processed, but you know, we, we've talked about this on our podcast and I'm so glad you included it in this. It's very important. You know, we have to get through the day and find moments of joy. Absolutely. Okay. And your last slide, this is, well, this is so wonderful, Charla. So much information here. So yeah, this is the, the phone numbers for Faces of the Law Center for the Missing and Exploited Children and the National Runway, Runaway <laughs> Safe Line. Um, because they're, they're all great resources, especially if you do have a child under the age of 21. Um, and a lot of people think it's only to 18, but no. Uh, there's families that get help all the way up to 21. And if what you about have a child, over, what about well, over 21? Is there any resources for there? And in a minute, I will read the website out loud for okay. you in case you're listening. Okay. But what about over 21? No. Well, and that's where I put the NAMI there. Um, you know, I I don't think I I don't know. Uh, that's a good question, Randy. I'll have okay. to research that because I know they have silver alerts. And okay. we have the Amber Alerts for kids. We have silver, silver for the elderly. But between the ages of 18 to about 55, there's nothing. And so unless if you're Native American in Oklahoma, we have a new one called the Red Alert um, that gets some of, they have some new agencies that they've started. And they're even going to add into NamUs for the Native Americans to have that special because they don't get nearly the attention they need. And on federal lands, there's different laws that come into play. But that's always been my thing. That's one of my goals. And the investigator that I work closely with out in Oklahoma, we want to change the law. We want to have something for mental health, you know, because we do have people that go missing. So like a green alert or some kind of alert that, you know, our kids really need help. Mm -hmm. when they go missing and it's really hard just as hard as for a senior or for a kid you know and so yeah. it, if not more so you know yet another so change we have to get past Absolutely. another yeah another I, I i can see mindy's face i have a feeling she's googling right now are you googling mindy <laughs> she's muted 
No, I'm not not googling. Are you googling? I'm just I'm, my looking. Face is probably reflecting uh, my distress and unhappiness when uh, with, with uh, the fact that this is only for children under 21. You know, um, we have people with Alzheimer's who go missing, and people look for them. Uh, we had a huge search in Minnesota a while back for um, a teenager with autism who was actually at a camp for people with autism and still he managed to be missing for quite quite a while. We all thought he would be dead, but he was finally found. But there were massive numbers of people. And um, so my face is probably reflect, reflecting that, um, you know, that, that when people like our sons go missing, who are over 21, nobody is looking hmm. very hard anyway. Yeah, that's interesting because I did have an instance and I know my son was over 21 where I, they, I call the local police and uh, they did make me wait the 24 hours, but they also took pity on me and said, well, we'll write down the information anyway. And at least they were aware and he was found. He was found inside a CVS eating Doritos because he didn't want to shoplift. So he figured if he just sat there and ate the Doritos in the middle of the store, it wasn't the same. I don't know. But he was, you know, it was two days without his meds and he was not. Well, insane. that's the part, you know, it's, it is good to report it because then if they're found they're they committed a crime or they're eating Doritos in the store, you know, if, if they're found for some other reason, then, um, or worse yet, if they have died and then they're not carrying identification. But if they're not, running into trouble, then I don't, I wonder mm -hmm. if anybody's really looking. So I guess, well, and you know, I will Google this when we're done and put it in the show notes of what your options are if it, you have an adult that's missing. But I think uh, you can't go wrong with letting the local police know. No, as not Charles at all. started off, you know, even if they're uh, adult age, these websites, by the way, missingkids.org, basesofthelost.org and 1-800-runaway.org. And their hotline numbers, I'm sure, will be on their websites or your local NAMI affiliate or NAMI state office are places that you can go and your your local police stations, right? Is that? Absolutely. And I think, too, if you're in one of the states that hasn't joined um, NamUs yet, really encourage Tell them it's important. You know, California is one place that's not on the list and neither is Wyoming. And both are two states that my daughter was found in while in psychosis. Um, by the grace of God, this last time when um, a sheriff did research online and found my old flyer that had my phone number on it and called me from Buffalo, Wyoming <laughs> and said, ma'am, do you have a child named Kylie I'm, oh, yes I do and <laughs> but here's the thing this was after California mind you so I, I kind of after that harrowing trip across country when Wyoming called not even two months later I was like you know they said well you need to come and get her and I go well sir what are our options here because they didn't have homeless there they didn't have mental health services this is like a town of like I don't know maybe 250 people and so they said well if you don't come and get her then she's going to go down to Casper and she's going to go to our state mental health hospital. And I go, okay, uh, be sure she calls me when she lands, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so she ended up, she was inpatient in Wyoming for 10 months. She got to number four on the state list. And I was so excited because I went and looked and you could do a vo virtual tour of their brand new facility. I thought, oh my God, she's finally going to get the help she needs. And they called me and said, well, we have to put her in a group home to do less restrictive. I go, what do you mean? We've already been through all this. Like, why are we going to go back to less restrictive? It doesn't work for her. And so, no. So she went, she lasted three months until someone lured her away from the group home. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from Seattle. I don't know what to do. I have a pillow and a tent. And they tell me I can't camp here. <laughs> so I bought her a ticket and brought her back. And so, but I think about the hard, you know, Joe Kendas of the world are not, I mean, they've all retired, but um, not in Wyoming. They're still there, but, you know, there's no way that they could look in that database. They didn't think to look in the database. They went to Google, you know, and so, but if Wyoming joined, they would have been able to know 
you know, where that she was missing California. She sat in jail in LA County for 96 days and she was in NamUs. They didn't even look. Wow. I think and that the only this is a key thing that you've told us tonight. And in addition to your story about missing persons and, and your tips that you found through the School of Hard Knocks, you are also a wonderful example of a warrior mother, you know, on all fronts. So thank you for that, Charla. You're very welcome. Uh, really, really important. Um, and then it, the unanswered question which maybe will be another episode sometime after you find them what do you do oh my god girl that was the other thing i was going to tell you when you're in crisis not only you got to figure out this whole thing but once you find them what do you do with them yeah you know that that trip back from california i was told take her to the crisis center in oklahoma city went knocked on the door and they go what are you talking about they didn't know who i they nobody told them by the they were supposed to take her and so, yeah, so we just jump right into crisis again. And so that's, that's lies the other problem. So yeah. maybe next season we'll talk about that. All right. That sounds Mimi, any final thoughts here? I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> um, again, it comes back to the, the same issue that we always talk about is the discrimination against people with mental illness. You, you see all the time uh, on the news stories of somebody with dementia who wandered off and they're covering the story and they're trying to help you find them and kids, especially kids who need medicine or things like that. But it's like, once again, this portion of the population, adults with serious mental illness are regarded as throwaway segment of the population in you know, medical care, mental health care, this kind of a situation just over and over again they're just the trash of our culture and it's disgusting and it needs to change and Amen. without a warrior mother Amen. what do people do is what i always wonder what's that i said without a warrior exactly. mother like yeah. each of us yeah. what do how do i mean our kids we have enough trouble when we're battling night and day at times when they're in crisis but what about someone all alone with well no you know i used to see the guy on the corner screaming at nobody and my first thought was always where's his mother like how does this happen where is his mother but now i understand it i mean yeah <laughs> we're warrior mothers but we're not warrior mothers because we're better than anyone else or love our kids anymore we're lucky we're privileged we're smart and we happen to have a constitution for this you know people of color and people without the economic resources i know where those mothers are they're sitting at home crying because they can't save their kid yeah it's and it's not a question are... of loving it's a it's a no. question of you know resources and uh you know support and knowledge Knowledge. I mean, I learned so much tonight. I, when my son was missing for five and a half months, but not really missing because he had a cell phone, and he asked me, "No, he didn't have a cell phone." But he said, "I'm I'm in Idaho. I'm not telling you where I am, but I'll call you once a week." So he called me once a week. So I was lucky that that he did that. Other than that, I wouldn't have known where to find him. He was in Idaho. It was totally all the way across the country. You know, and he would call me and he'd go, oh, yeah, the psychic vampires got me this week. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I think I needed a job. So I went to where the homeless people can work, but I got scared and I went away. And, you know, now he's one of the people that probably looks scary. So, you know, we just we do our best. This is what I just keep saying, doing our best. We're doing our best. And we're doing our best to help other people know what to do if they haven't had the privilege of knowledge that we've had or the privilege of privilege, which we acknowledge all the time here. Um, love is strong. Knowledge Absolutely. has to be found and and respect for people like our sons and daughters and loved ones of, you know, just I was having a conversation with a one of our former guests, Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman today, and we were talking about like, well, who cares about schizophrenia? Everybody should care about schizophrenia. Everybody should care. It's just a diff, it's the most difficult one. So 
schizophrenia gets under-researched and underfunded and swept under the rug. And we're trying this to change This is a that. perfect uh, segue for our September program with Gordon Levine from the Schizophrenia and Psychosis yep. Action Alliance. Those are some of the issues we talk about all the time in that organization too. Awesome. But I have to say, I was I spoke at a funeral over the weekend and the right before me was the young man who had died who had a serious mental illness. Um, his psychiatrist spoke and he said about the family of this young man who died um, that it was so wonderful that they were present, they surrounded their son with love. They were always there fighting for him. And he said, uh, which we kind of know, but he's somebody who sees lots of patients. He said, that is so rare. That is so rare. And I've heard so many mental health professionals say that. How do we, uh, how do we get more families like yours? And all the programs we've had answer that question. Um, you know, HIPAA and not having families be respected and talked to and the kinds of things we're talking about here tonight. Is anyone looking for our kids? Yeah, and and I think the answer, I think what happens and we are not here to put down any other parent, believe me, we know how we can all get worn down and just go, I, th I throw up my hands now. I, I've done everything I can, it's your life. So we get it, we totally get it. And I'm there, so when, when my son got arrested, I'm like, well, that's it. That's it. I've given him 40 good years of life. Let him, you know, there's it, we're all human and we all have those feelings and we, and we're just MRQs, mothers who refuse to quit or warrior moms. And we're doing our best and we're trying to help other people, you know, up their game as well, because everybody wants to help. We often just don't know how. So I think Charlie, you've done a fantastic service tonight by sharing everything you've learned with all of us. And uh, if you wish to have a copy of the PowerPoint, just contact me at randy at randyk.com. There are Y-E's at the end of both of my names. And I will um, send you a copy of Charla's uh, very informational PowerPoints. And um, we'll see you at our next episode with Gordon to, to further the conversation. Hang in there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Charla. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.